Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the conclusion chapter of the education of Augie Morasti. And I'm going to go through some of these discussion questions that I have up on uh, the course homepage. First one is, what religious rituals were the children forced to attend or practice? And what happened if a child fell asleep during prayers? Uh, so Augie, he describes in the opening of this paragraph, or of this chapter, how there was sort of a very rigid or strict uh, routine that the children were forced to go to in terms of their church service. Uh, so they were woken up every morning at 7.30, they had to go to confession, uh, take communion, um, and then every night they had to do benediction and then uh, nightly prayers uh, that lasted, you know, 20 minutes or so. And he's, he reveals that, you know, some of the children would fall asleep, some of the small kids who were, you know, tired and saying their nightly prayers fell asleep and the heartless nun, Sister Mercy, would smack them on the back of the head if they dared fall asleep. Um, but it sounds, you know, he's sort of describing how, how it was like almost like a forced routine uh, that all the children were forced to partake in and if they, even if they fell asleep, they were punished for that. Um, and then I, I asked, um, what parallels does Augie suggest exist between residential schools and Hitler's regime? What similarities does Brother Le Pain share with Hitler? Um, so he does talk about Brother Le Pain uh, again. So this is the one brother who has haunted his mind uh, from when he was a child and even now. Uh, his memories of this man continually haunt him. And he characterizes Brother Le Pain as somebody who has a sense of racial superiority or a sense of his own superiority and treats others as if they are objects or um, dehumanizes them. Uh, so I'll just read you this paragraph about Brother Le Pain on page 60. Uh, Brother Le Pain was a man dedicated to preserving the image of superiority of the semi super race of white man over Indian. Like the German super race tried to establish during, during the time of Hitler's regime. As I look back, what has happened at the school is basically the same thing except on a smaller scale with the same principles. So uh, I don't know if um, we can say it's exactly the same thing as what happened uh, in Hitler's regime in Germany, um, but I do think these are both examples of genocide, uh, what happened in Canada in the residential schools and then what happened in Germany. Um, and he's, he acknowledges that there is the same uh, racist ideology that informed both uh, the Holocaust, the concentration camps, the extermination camps. Uh, of Hitler's Germany and the same kind of racist uh, ideology that backed the residential schools and was prescribed by uh, some of the authority figures like Brother Le Pain who were, who were in authority uh, positions in the church and in the school. Um, so he's saying sort of on a smaller scale, same principles uh, informed both uh, historical events. Um, uh, so whether it was a, a cultural genocide or um, in some ways a genocide, a physical genocide of, of the children, uh, many did die uh, when they were there and we've seen many examples of um, neglect and uh, lack of nutrition, uh, lack of you know, proper care uh, and disregard for the health and, and welfare of the children. Um, so that could be also interpreted as a kind of uh, genocide as well. Uh, what year did Augie get out of school? What was his mindset after getting released from the school? Uh, so Augie describes how uh, he had um, survived and learned uh, you know, it made him a harder person, I think, a tougher person, having endured that. Um, but it made him feel very vengeful when he came out of that school. Uh, he was angry. 
Um, and he says, when I got out of school in March 1944, I was already starting to feel the pangs of revenge. And I was very well trained to take punishments of all sorts. So he was, you know, uh, talked about, you know, I, uh, learning, he learned how to endure all types of abuse, uh, learned to fight and take punishments. Um, and he says, I learned the hard way how to survive once I got out of St. Therese. I would never let another human abuse me again. And I've been fighting ever since then from bullies to racist bastards. Um, so he, he became a fighter and it's evident that he's still fighting even in his, you know, old age. Um, he doesn't give up. He endures, he fights, uh, to survive. Um, but emotionally, uh, psychologically, we could see, uh, how those struggles have, uh, taken their toll on him. Uh, he gives an anecdote of, uh, Br'er Le Pain encouraging the children to fight one another and almost treating it as if they were like um, objects or they're treating the children as if they're objects of his amusement, pitting one against another in a kind of dog fight, he calls it. Um, and it, get, it has that perception of as a kind of dog fight, like uh, he, they're perceived or treated uh, like animals, um, like objects or possessions of Berla Payne and uh, just for his amusement uh, he gets the boys to fight one another um, and I guess it, it could also teach them to use violence uh, outside of the school as well um, so I don't think it's a very positive lesson that they learned uh, by beating each other up um, and it also tells us a little bit about Brother or Brer Le Pain's uh, way of uh, kind of objectifying the children and, and treating them almost like they were animals. Uh, even the words that uh, Augie describes Brother Le Pain, um, he, he uh, calls him uh, the boy's keeper and um, almost like he was a general uh, of his own army. So he's kind of in this position of a total authority over the boys who he, uh, he, he sees as his own objects or possessions. On um, page 61, he talks or he refers to Brother Le Pain. He says, who never swayed from his, total, his ways of total domination in his position of boy's keeper. He was the complete lord and general of all 55 boys that were supposedly in his care. And all I think of it now, he was somehow paranoid in his, his position of authority and wanted to show who was boss. So it's kind of like Augie is in this paragraph kind of doing a psychological kind of case study on Berla Payne and saying like he was a paranoid in his position of authority and, and treated the boys that way because he was so paranoid. So it's almost like he's analyzing Br'er Le Pain's character and why he was the way he was. Um, and it's, a, it's also acknowledging how he, he viewed uh, Brother Le Pain as a child, as kind of somebody who was like a general, somebody with absolute power who controlled the minds and bodies of all 55 of these boys who were under his authority. Um, what impact does Augie hope his story has on Canadian society? That's the next question. Um, and Augie talks a little bit about his purpose, his intent in sharing his story on page 62. Uh, and he says, I'll just read you the quote. Uh, I sincerely hope that what I have related here will have some impact. So all that has happened in our school and other schools in all parts of Canada the abuse and terror in the lives of Indian children does not ever occur again. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, there is this idea that history repeats itself, um, and I hope that's not true. Uh, but uh, in this case, he's he's you know there is some very valuable lessons to be learned in in what not to do uh, for education of children and care for children and uh, what 
what children need and I think our society knows now more uh, that this was uh, a very uh, destructive historical event that happened in Canada and other parts of the world and uh, we're still healing and uh, trying to overcome some of the other impacts that have uh, come from residential school and the res residential school system so I think acknowledging the importance of of Augie's story and other stories of residential school survivor survival uh, is, is a big part and and plays a, a large role in, in making sure that uh, this kind of thing does not ever happen again and how Augie's story sort of fits within the larger uh, themes and ideas of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission uh, I think how his story fits in a kind of reconciliation aspect of of acknowledging what has happened and, and trying to heal and move forward um, and minimize some of these the negative impacts uh, of the past uh, Augie tells another anecdote uh, of his um, hardships in the residential school uh, he says uh, he tells the story of when he was or sort of kind of continues the, from the previous chapter where he was uh, kneeling on the hard cold cement floor for three hours and uh, it sort of tells us the level of influence that Le Pain had on the children because he was told not to move and the children would not move um, in fear of being beaten uh, and they end up soiling their pants uh, going peeing themselves basically uh, and in fear that if they moved they would have been beaten and then uh, even if you know it shows their level of obedience and fear that they have for the man who is in charge of them Uh, and even then, with their soiled pants, they were, of course, beaten for soiling their pants uh, the next morning. So it kind of tells us, like, there's no right way of behaving that could have resorted in not being beaten. Um, Augie ends this chapter with one of his happiest moments. Um, and I think it's important that he kind of ends, he wants... Uh, to sort of end his narrative on a kind of happy or more positive note uh, and he recalls this memory he says from the end of my school days uh, and it describes him uh, reuniting kind of with his family his father and they decide to uh, sort of take a trip up to Flin Flon um, so he says, uh, in the fall of 1945, my father decided that we should go up to the southern part of Reindeer Lake, a place appropriately called Deep, Be Deep Bay, a place that everyone in the area of South End knew was abundant with lake and brown trout. So we all decided to build a large cabin and fish storage shed, and we waited for freeze up. Uh, there was an abundance of reindeer, and so they were very well fed. And he ends this chapter with kind of this illustration. I, I didn't include it here, but I have a picture of, of reindeer. Um, and the illustration uh, shows Augie uh, and his father and uh, others uh, fishing in a hole in the ice. And in the background, there's just reindeer. And the whole scene is very peaceful and open, uh, beautiful illustration of uh, the North and the kind of lifestyle and memories he had uh, of his father. So I, I think it's interesting that uh, he ends the story with this happy um, image. Uh, and he says, uh, this was one of the happiest days of my life, free from pain and loneliness. It was like coming out of incarceration for a little while, that first real look at Flin Flon. Uh, so he's using that simile of, of coming out of incarceration. It's like coming out of jail 
uh, this is a moment of sort of freedom and and beauty that is missing in his life uh, in residential school and then seeing for the first time in a long time uh, just the beauty and peacefulness of that open uh, natural world uh, that was taken away from him uh, during the residential school. Uh, so it kind of could represent a kind of uh, connection to his culture and traditions, um, hunting and fishing with his father, building the log cabin, all these things that sort of connect him back to the lifestyle and family and culture that he had prior to uh, the residential school. Um, but I think it's it's a it's a moment of sort of clarity and beauty and and contrast from uh, what the kinds of the kind the incarceration that he experienced uh, in residential school. So you have a kind of juxtaposed opposition between the beauty and freedom of the natural world and then the very rigid, harsh, cruel incarceration that he experienced. Uh, forced into by uh, through the school system.